Yeah. Got it. Welcome, yeah. Welcome everyone to our uh, Wednesday evening Bible study on the chosen. Uh, we are going to uh, start reading some scripture passages. I'm going to start building them out. So first one, uh, I need somebody to look up Mark chapter two, verses one to two. Glorious God. Okay. Luke chapter 4, 36 through 37. Alyssa. What was All right. The, sorry, what was the um, chapter? The chapter 4. It's chapter 4, yep. 36 through 37. Okay. All right, a bunch of Matthews. Matthew chapter 8. Who wants the Matthews? Oh, good man. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. 5, verses 21 to 24. Twenty-eight verses eighteen to twenty. Chapter ten verses five to twenty. Uh, chapter ten verses twenty-four to thirty-three. If you want to split that up, Pastor, I'll help him out. Yeah, I'll put them up. Anybody that wants to spell him, yeah. we don't. We don't want to wear him out. Sure. That's all of them. That's our Matthews. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Colossians 3. Chrissy. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 5. Norma, you feel like taking one? Okay. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 5. Okay. Uh, couple from John. From the Gospel of John. Jimmy. John 1, verse 48, and uh, John 10, verse 14. Couple of second Corinthians. Joe, can I twist your arm? Yeah. Okay, Joe, the first one is second Corinthians 4, verses 5 to 7. Okay. And then uh, chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Okay. Uh, chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. Yep. Oh, I have another John one. Who did I give uh, John to? James. James, we've also got uh, John chapter 13, 27 to 29. I will put all these on the screen. John 3, 3 to 6. That's all our Johns. Okay, got all of those. That leaves us with four more. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 14. Mike. Job chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. Chrissy. Two more. Isaiah 35, 3 to 10. I'll do it. Gary. And you know what? The last one. It's Psalm 3, but maybe we'll all say that together. There's a reason to it, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get started. Let's get busy. Gator done. Yeah. All right, new share. Come on, let me have a new share here. There we go. You want to get that? You want to get, no, we don't want to get that. Not yet. And we want the screen. We want to put this on the screen. Okay. I'm ready now. Carry Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. When Jesus again entered Capernaum, some days later, people heard that he was home. So many people were gathered together that there was no more room, not even by the door. And he was speaking the word to them. This tells us what? When Jesus comes to Capernaum, who follows him? Everybody. <laughs> All right. uh, Luke chapter. Does it say that people heard that he was home? 
Well, there wasn't like a telephone or anything. Okay. Word of word of word of mouth would pass. That that he was there in. Yeah, and so. Okay. Everybody flocks to him. Okay. Yep. Luke four. Thirty six to thirty seven. Melissa. They were all filled with awe and began to say to one another, "What is this message? With authority and power, he commands unclean spirits, and they come out." News about him spread to every place in the surrounding area. So not just the city of Capernaum, surrounding area. You've got people that don't live there coming, right? One more, Matthew 8. Verse 1. Who's my Matthew guinea pig? Bill is. Yeah. All right. Here's your first one, Matthew 8, 1. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed. Good. The point here, this is Matthew 8, is right after the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. People don't say, okay, Jesus, see you later. They follow him. So we've seen repeatedly, they follow him, and he, of course, he spent a lot of time in Capernaum, which means people are following him. Now, before this episode, I never thought about this, but it's actually very clever. If people that don't live there are following him, <laughs> They live at a distance. You think they're going to walk a whole distance home at night? So what are they going to do? They're going to camp out. Camp out yeah. They're going to camp out. And this will be the scene that we start with at the beginning. You have what uh, Atticus is going to call a shanty town. And at first I didn't like it. I'm like, well, it doesn't say that people were camped outside of Capernaum in the gospel. But you know what? It makes sense. They got to have a safe place to stay. We're told repeatedly crowds followed him wherever he went. Gotta have a place to stay. They probably did. Yeah, no. All right. Bill, we're gonna stick with you and we're gonna move now to Matthew 5, verses 21 to 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. If you remember, Jesus was preaching this in last, the last episode. That was a major part of the episode last time, right? Jesus preaching. Do you remember who the camera showed when he was talking about this? It was one of the disciples. I had to apologize to Mary. Mary. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it hit, was Matthew? It hit Matthew. James. Matthew. Who did, who, who did Matthew... Who was coming to mind with Matthew to think when he heard this? Who did he have a disagreement with? His dad. His dad. And do you remember how the episode ends? Where does Matthew show up? He calls him son. Yeah. You want to see a little bit more of that? Yes. You'll see a little bit more of it. But this comes to <laughs> mind. But there's something else I'm going to look at, too, that, say, that piggybacks off of this. Uh, Colossians 3. Verses 13 to 15. Chrissy. Okay. Bearing with one another, <laughs> one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. At 15, you said? Mm -hmm. Please. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Good. Forgive one another as you've been forgiven, basically, right? Matthew heard Jesus preach about forgiveness. Do you think he's going to offer words of forgiveness or admit his wrong to his father? Think that might be possible? No. Do you think his father needs to offer words of forgiveness back to Matthew? Yes. 
true for all of us, right? And what we keep in mind is we want to be forgiven just, we, we should forgive others just as we want the Lord to forgive us. How do we want the Lord to forgive us? Forgive us for our sins. Yeah. Completely? Yeah. How about over and over and over and over and over? Remember Peter asked Jesus, how, times, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, I tell you, 70 times seven. Seven is a number of completeness. When you multiply it by 10, which is 70, and then you add another seven on besides that, Jesus is saying, you just keep forgiving. That's a difficult thing, isn't it? I don't think there's anybody in this world that has that nailed down. I sure don't. That's eternal life, though. Of course, an eternal life will have nothing to forgive one another for because we won't offend one another because there will be no sin and there'll be no anger and there'll be no selfishness. All those things that cause us to offend our brother. So we'll see what words that Matthew and his father share at the beginning of this. All right, moving along. Moving on down the highway to 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Norma. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious, <clears throat> you also, like living stones, are being built as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood in order to bring the spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it good. That's good, right there. We are chosen by God. Another way to say that is we are called. Right? You're called by God as living stones to be built up into a spiritual house. What's the spiritual house you're called to be a part of? The church, the church, house of God built without hands, living stones, not dead stones that sit there to do anything, but living stones that take spend their lives serving the Lord and serving one another in love. And part of that is we love and forgive one another, right? The idea here where I picked this is we're called, you're set aside for a holy purpose. You heard the term sanctification. Fancy word for saying, set aside for a holy purpose. What we are drawn to faith, we're brought to faith, that's conversion. And after conversion, the life we live in the church is sanctification. It's our life of being set apart to be made holy. Of course, it doesn't happen like that, right? We're not perfectly holy. We're declared that by the Lord. But in our words and actions, it's an ongoing process of the Lord making us holy. Chosen for that. And you could even say... Because we know the spiritual house, Paul has a great analogy for that. We are the body of Christ. Body has many members. You, each one of you that have been called here to Lamb of God, you have a purpose here. You're a finger. You're a toe. You're an eyebrow. You're an eyelash. Your hair. Whatever it is, you have a purpose here. And you've been given unique gifts and talents by God to use. It makes you special, doesn't it? And if you're not here, we're missing out, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're missing an important part. One of my arguments to those people that think that they can sit at home and worship God and not be a part of anything. God didn't call you to sit at home. He wants you to worship him. He does want you to worship him at home, but he needs you to be part of the bigger picture here. That he already called you and gave you the gifts. Before you were born, gave you the gifts to serve him. Pretty special, isn't it? Thank you, Norma. All right, James, we turn to uh, the yes. Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple there. First one, John 1, verse 48. She planted them outside. Then you said to them, how do you know me? Remember that? That was when uh, we had that one of the earlier episodes. Uh, did Jesus, well, actually, oh, I'm sorry, keep up, continue on with verse 48. We need the whole thing. Uh, then you said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw it. Remember that? I saw you. That was true for Nathaniel. I think it's true for you and me. Oh, yeah. 
He saw you and knew you before you were born. He sees you now. <clears throat> so I'll pick up on that idea a little bit more. Uh, we'll turn to uh, John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. He not only sees you, he knows you. Which, as I said on Sunday, that can be kind of scary. There's some things he knows about me. I would rather he didn't, but he does. But despite that, what did he do for me? Gave his life to save me. And continues to reach out to me and cause me to be in repentant faith. All out of love, because he is my good shepherd. That's what he does for me now. Uh, we're going to continue with that vein. Bill, we're going to do Matthew 28. Verses 18 to 20, very familiar verses. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He sees you. He knows you. He is with you always. There's never a time that he, through his spirit he is not with you. Uh, there's one of the Psalms. Where can I go to flee from your spirit? If I go to the highest heavens, you are there. If I go into the deepest seas, valleys, you are there. Always. Always sees you. Is always concerned about you. Always caring for you. That's Jesus. All right, Bill, we're in Matthew. We're going to stay there for a little bit. Let's turn now to Matthew chapter 10. And we want to read verses uh, 5 to 20. Matthew 10, 5 to 20. This, this is the only part that, uh, of, the, of the plot that you'll see that it's biblical. We're going to see this in act. Everything else is kind of extra biblical. It has basis in scripture, a lot of it, which we're reading through, but this is the only real reenactment. Go ahead, brother. These 12, Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without paying. Acquire no gold, nor silver, nor copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, <laughs> nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that, that house or town. Truly I say to you, you will be more bearable on that day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak, for what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So this is the sending of the disciples out two by two. In doing this, they actually take on a new vocation, a new role. They become apostles. Disciple is a student, a learner. Apostle, a good way to translate that into English is they are an ambassador. Now, you think, what does an ambassador do for the president? What kind of power does an ambassador have? Kind of a negotiator, I think. He's empowered to go speak to another country's leader or important people. And who does he speak for? Himself? 
No, for the, the yeah. president, yeah, for the king, for the ruler. That's what an apostle does. The apostle is speaking for somebody else, and that's Jesus Christ. Not just speaking, but acting on behalf of them. Has the power to act in certain areas. What is Jesus going to empower these disciples to go out and do? Hmm? Spread the word. Of the he embraced the dead. What, what was that, Jill? To heal and raise the dead. Cleanse yeah. lepers. He's going to empower them to do the miracles that he's doing. Now, you guys are the disciples. If he tells you that, what, what are you going to be thinking? Me? <laughs> I'm going to heal people like you, Jesus? I'm going to cast out demons? Are you kidding me? Raise the dead? Are you kidding me? Did Jesus give them that power? He has that authority. He doesn't need to be there to do it. Once again, he's God. He sees them and he can empower them to do all of these things. The disciples are going to have some great reactions to hearing this. and That's some of them. Okay. Uh, next up is 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians... This is Jill, chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the God who said, light will shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. We hold this treasure in clay jars to show that its extraordinary power is from God and not from us. What is Paul talking about? What are the clay jars? Your hearts. Us. Us. Clay jar would be a pretty ordinary utensil. Nothing special about it. That's us, right? Do we have something valuable inside of us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who brings the gospel, the power to change people's hearts and lives. If we are ordinary and we're sharing this message of Jesus Christ, not as like a Billy Graham preacher, but just one-on-one -on -one to people, and it changes their life. Are we giving them any reason to come and say, well, Melissa, you're, you're some kind of, a, of an angel or something. You're super powerful. No. Where does the power come from? Not from me, but from Jesus. If you ever think you're not qualified to go share the gospel, you're wrong. Jesus picks unqualified people to do extraordinary things. He's going to have that message for the disciples question. Well, we're we're not worthy. Doesn't matter. It's not about you. You're going to witness by your unworthiness, you witness to me. Okay. Let's see here. Next up is. Bill, we're going back to you, Matthew. Chapter 10. Verses 24 to 33. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above the, his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Belsbal, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, feel, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. 
Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledge me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Excellent, Bill. Thank you. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher. If the master of the house is called Belzebul. Belzebul is a slang, a derogatory term for Satan. It comes from a name for one of the Canaanite gods of old, uh, Baal. I don't remember exactly what it is, but one of the gods, many of the Canaanites worshipped was Baal. Beelzebul is Lord of the Flies or Lord of the Dung Heap. So it's a derogatory term and it's used against Satan. Satan is Beelzebul. So Jesus, what are they calling him if they call him Beelzebul? They're calling him Satan. It says, if it happens to your teacher, what can the students accept? What, what, what can they expect to happen? You're going to hear the same thing? You're going to be slandered? Jesus was slandered. Was he accused wrongly? Mm -hmm. He could be accused wrongly. Was he mistreated? Sometimes we'll be mistreated. Servant is not greater than his master. A disciple is not above his teacher, a servant above his master. However, Jesus says this. Um, I think this is the right one. We go down to 33, right? Mm -hmm. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Who can kill your body? <laughs> Pretty much anybody, right? Yep. When that happens, what happens to your soul? Go to heaven. Be with Jesus? Anybody hurt you anymore after that? No. Did the devil do anything to you? No. You've won. Who or what can destroy both your body and soul in hell? God. And he'll send you there. Why? You have no faith. Whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my father who is heaven, which means before the great judge. I don't know you because they died without knowing me, without being in faith in me. But everyone who confesses me before others, and how do we confess Jesus before others? Because we are in faith towards him. When you have, have faith in him, it's in, it's, you, it's, it's, you, you're going to end up showing that to somebody. You can't help it. The Holy Spirit does that in you, right? You live a set-apart life. You live different from other people. And maybe it's even only one person, but in some way, shape, or form, you'll witness your faith to them. That's confessing him before other people. Doesn't matter what they do to you here on this earth, and, and we don't like this because we hey, you, you know, your body, your life on this earth is precious. But just know because somebody takes it, it's not the end. You win. You want to extend your life on this earth as long as possible, but to be his servant, not to make this heaven on earth. Never will be. It's a totally different way of looking at things, isn't it? That's life in Christ. Things are different than the world. Up is down and down is up as far as the world is concerned. But uh, we live by different values and things have different importance because we have the hope of eternal life to come. All right, uh, enough said on that. John, we're back to John. Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 27 to 29. James, that is you. John 13, 27 to 29. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What are you going to do quickly? Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Good. Of course, this is Judas. We know what Judas does at the Last Supper. The uh, reason why we cited this is because here's evidence that Judas, what was his job with the disciples? 
get the money back. I accepted that. This episode brings up a good question. We know amongst the other disciples that was used to handling money. Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> yeah, who's in charge of the, the, the purse strings for the disciples? It's not Matthew. It's Jesus. No reason in scripture is given why Matthew isn't, but it's just a point to think about. They, they give a pretty good answer here. But also we know and we suspect that part of the reason why Judas ends up being a traitor is because he's holding the money back. We also know for other parts of scripture that he used to stick his hand in there to take the money. All right, we're going to turn now to 2 Corinthians. We don't see that happening yet. Judas has not turned. He appears to be a pretty good disciple, but we know all of these things. We know, right? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 18. Jill, that'll be you. Yep. As a result, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him that way. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Good. Thank you. Regard no one according to the flesh. What does it mean to regard somebody according to the flesh? Their actions, what they do. Very superficial. You're a nice looking lady. You're a handsome gentleman. I like you. You're friendly. You're outgoing. That person over there is not nice looking. Looks whatever, grumpy, old, mean. I, I don't know if I want to go talk to them or have anything to do with it. That would be regarding somebody in the, in the flesh. How are we supposed to regard somebody? If they're in Christ, we are what? A new creation. New creation on the inside, right? Born again. In fact, that's our passage from John 3. We're changed on the inside. What we were is gone. Now, there's remnants of what we used to be, If you, especially if you're an adult that's come to you came to faith as an adult. There's remnants of what you used to be before you were, you were converted. But that's passing away. Holy Spirit's working it. And even those of you that have been Christians since your baptism, he's still working on you because we never get rid of that sinful nature, but it keeps being put down. In Christ, we're a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And that's from who? Verse 18. Jesus. From God. Yeah. Here from God. Who reconciled us to himself. That's what Jesus did, his death and resurrection on the cross. We're no longer enemies of God because of our sin. We're reconciled to him so we can go do what? He gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. We preach the gospel to others. We're reconciling them to God as well. Preaching the gospel brings them to faith, and now they're reconciled with God. God is no longer their enemy or because of because sin is forgiven. And when God's no longer your enemy, then you can begin to reconcile with your fellow man, especially your brother and sister in faith. That's the ministry of the church, reconciliation. And we do that because we are a new creation. We'll follow up on that a little bit. we got to give uh, James one more passage to read here. John 3, these are, should be familiar words. John 3, chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. Jesus answered, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Peter said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When does this new creation start in us? Yeah, yeah good Lutherans, right? Whenever you see water in the word, the spirit, yep. That's conversion. 
you are made a new creation. And in fact, we continue to be remade a new creation every time we sin and we turn and repent in faith back to Christ. We are restored constantly. The ongoing work of baptism, constant restoration, constant washing away of sin and constant work of the Holy Spirit to turn us back and look at Christ. All right. If you have any questions on any of these passages, please stop me as I bulldoze ahead. We can talk about them some more. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> this is going to be Jill verses 7 to 10. Therefore, to keep me from becoming arrogant due to the extraordinary nature of these revelations, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not become arrogant. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he would take it away from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will be glad to boast all the more in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may shelter me. That is why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. To read your passage, Paul, he had this thorn in his flesh. We have no idea what it is. Some theologians conjecture because he was blinded on the road to Damascus, it has something to do with his eyes. It could have been. We really don't know. Whatever it was, does it sound like it affected his ability to do ministry somewhat? No. Yeah. That's why he wants it removed. If I didn't have this, Lord, I could be much more productive for you, whatever it was. If it was his eyesight, he could see better to go places. If it was actually a real problem with his foot, well, that would impede his ability to walk, wouldn't it? Yeah. Some conjecture he stuttered. Because at one point he devalues himself as not being as great an oratician uh, as as these Pharisees that are going around and, and preaching a, a false gospel. We don't really know. But what's his answer when he prays about it from the Lord? His grace is enough. Why? Because and I my am power and I am strong. Perfect in weakness. Kind of dovetails back to that previous passage, isn't it? We're treasures in clay jars. So we don't shine the light on, of glory on ourselves, on the Lord that's lifted us up and placed us there. Paul, even though he wasn't the most slick creature in the world and had this thorn in his flesh, yet look at his uh, ability to plant churches and, and all the letters that he wrote, not because he and himself was such a great man, but because the Holy Spirit did great things in him. And at all, he always pointed it back to, the, to God. Glory be to God, not him. Why I delight in weakness, insult, hardships, persecution, and difficulties. For when I am weak, when I show how weak I am, I show how strong God is in me. So again, we don't like that. We don't like to hear that we might be subject to insults and hardships and persecutions. But when you are and you remain in faith, you give such a strong witness to a God that's greater than the hardships around you and all the things that you face. Okay. Mike? Billy? Sir. You feel like reading some scripture, Billy? Sir. You want to grab your guitar and sing it? <laughs> I let you down, but... This is uh, Psalm 139, brother. I want you to read verses 13 and 14, if you would. For you created my inner organs. Uh, you wove me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearful and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. You, you, your works are wonderful. And my soul knows that very well. Good. This is part of a psalm that is a great argument for uh, right to life against abortion. You created my inner organs. You wove me together in my mother's womb. But I say this, it speaks to you. Each one of you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Each of you have wonderful talents and gifts that you've been given. Some of them are very evident. Norma, we know what's Norma's great gift that she uses for God's glory. Playing the organ. Music. Terry says that you play with your fingers. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. Air piano. Thank God we have Norma to play. There's churches that have no organists. And we have two. Each one of you has some gift, and maybe it's a talent like that. Maybe it's one that's hard to put your finger on. Maybe it's part of your characteristic. You're just friendly. You're outgoing. Do you, do you, if you recognize Chrissy's drive to get this pictorial directory going, that's a gift, Chrissy. You have that drive. You have that will and that desire. When other people would just say, well, people don't sign up if they sign up. That's true of all of you. And maybe it hasn't come to the fore yet, but you all have that, and it comes from the Lord, and he wants you to use it. You're as valuable as the next person because he created you and gave you these gifts and talents. And then there's the spiritual gifts that we have that are even harder to define. Hospitality, an ability to share the gospel. I have a real good friend who is an evangelist. He can talk to anybody and take start a regular conversation and turn it to Christ in a way that I envy. He can do that. But each of you has those things. And a lot of the ways you discover it is you do something and it works. And all of a sudden, people are going up like me telling Chrissy, man, oh, man, you're doing a good job. When you hear that from somebody and it's serving the Lord, you're using your gifts and talents that he gave you. And especially if it makes you happy. Rock on and do it. If we had everybody in this church using their gifts and talents the way God said, we'd have to find things for people to do. We would. All right, so moving on. We're almost there. We're almost time for the to watch the episode. Job chapter one. I've been, uh, one of the things I do when I work out one of my days is I listen to uh, guys read through Job and talk about it. It's an interesting book. Uh, Job chapter one, verse 13 to 21. Uh, Chrissy, you want to give this a shot? Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Then there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the beans fell upon them and took them and struck down the service with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking... There came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Shen Chaldeans, Chaldeans. Chaldeans formed their groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. We'll stop there for a moment. Picture this. Yeah. Job was a righteous man, which means that he wasn't perfect. He used the sacrificial system so the Lord would forgive his sins. And it says he not only did that for himself, but he would give sacrifices for his kids. And what happens one after another? One after another, his servants are put to death. He's lost his flocks, which was money. That's like your bank account being burned up. And notice what it happens. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you while he was still speaking, here comes another one. And then here comes another one. Blow after blow after blow after blow. And it keeps getting worse and worse and worse until the final one is your kids are dead. Didn't even have a chance to sit and ponder this. One blow after another. I can't imagine what it was like to be Joe. And let us hear Job's response. Verse 20. Verses 20 and 21. Okay. 
Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. You've probably heard this before, but just think about it. I wish I could tell you that if this happened to me, the first thing I would do is fall to the ground and worship. I might fall to the ground, but my words would not be very worshipful. He was a man of great faith, and that faith was sorely tested. He was not patient. The one thing he did is he never stopped believing in God. Got angry at God. Accused God wrongly because it really wasn't God doing all this. It was Satan allowed to do this to him. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. What, what is he saying about our your life and my life? What does it mean to be naked from your mother's womb? He came with nothing. Came with nothing. Not just clothes, but Everything that you hold in your hand. Do you deserve it? Did you earn it? No. It's all there. And if you lose any one of those things, then none of us are going to go through what Job did. If you lose some of those things, what happens? We get angry. It's wrong, Lord. It's wrong. Is it really, though? We didn't deserve it to begin with. It was his gracious gift, and if he chooses to take it, Shouldn't our attitude be the same as Job's? Job is going to have all and even more restored to him when the book ends. You and I, anything you lose in this world will be more than restored in eternal life, including all of your loved ones that pass away. They will be restored to you, healthier and better than they ever were. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Totally different way to look at our lives and the things that we have now, isn't it? You can't really look at that or accept that only by faith. You got to have the Holy Spirit and faith to be able to really start to make that part of your life and who you are. All right, Isaiah 35, verses 3 to 10. Chrissy. Yeah. Oh, I think that was you. I think it's oh. me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Carrie, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Carrie. Sorry to, sorry to steal your thunder. Wake up, Carrie. Yeah. Uh, spike them the weak hands and make the shaky knees steady. Tell those who have a fearful heart, be strong. Do not be afraid. Look, your God will come with vengeance. With God's own retribution, he will come and save you. Keep going to oh, verse 10. 10. Then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unplugged. The cripple will leap like a deer and the tongue of a, the mute will sing for joy. Waters will flow in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The burning sand will become a pool and in the thirsty ground there will be springs of water. There will be grass, reeds, and rushes where the haunts of jackals once lay. A highway will be there, a road that will be called the Holy Way. The impure will not walk there. It will be reserved for those who walk in that Holy Way. Wicked fools will not wander onto it. No lion will be there, nor will any pervious animals go up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Then those ransomed by the whole, by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with a joyful shout, and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow will sorrow and sighing will flee away. So this is Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied two major things into the future. One, he prophesied that because of the evil, Jerusalem and, and Judah was going to be captured by Babylon and taken into exile. Then he also had these wonderful words of restoration, which find this finds partial fulfillment with the exiles being able to return home to Jerusalem. But there's a completer fulfillment, and can you guess when that is? Yes. Yes. 
This is a picture of that. And, and I bring this up. Do you remember there's two Jameses, right? There's big James and little James. Little James has a problem. Do you remember what it is? Mm -hmm. He limps. Yeah, he's got some kind of deformity where he limps. Can't be too pleasing to go through life like that, right? <laughs> Jesus brings this up because what does it say in verse 6? <laughs> in eternal life, he's not going to be crippled anymore. And all the problems, other problems that you and I have, and we could all cite problems that we have we wish weren't with us. Some of them are physical, physical, maybe some of them are emotional, character problem. Brothers and sisters, those are going to be gone. They won't even be remembered. <laughs> we 70, 80 years, we're lucky. Some people 90, 100. How long are you going to live in eternal life? Forever. Forever. We suffer such a short period of time here. And Jesus is going to bring up a good point with James, and it's something we need to remember too. Could God heal whatever's wrong with you right now, no matter what it is? Could he take it away? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Paul prayed. Paul didn't have it taken away. There's things in our lives that aren't going to be taken away. And it gets frustrating. And you might even be able to argue, I could live a so much better life for you, Lord, if you got rid of this. But it's going to be gone. Be gone forever in eternal life. And whatever you're struggling with now, like Paul, it, it serves to show the power of God working through somebody who's imperfect. The perfect power of God in our imperfect bodies glorifies him. And the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel. All right. You got one more questions or comments on anything up to this point, though? These good passages? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. We're going to read together uh, Psalm 3. And the reason why I want to read it together oh. is uh, at the end of uh, end of this episode, you're going to have the disciples gather together. And they're preparing to go out two by two. And you can imagine they're a little bit scared. Uh, as Peter's going to bring up, he said, we're going to have to do what Jesus did, which means we're going to, we're going to, excuse my French, piss off the religious leaders and the Romans. So they gather together, and what did they do? They turned to this psalm that they have memorized as a way to recognize God's power and, and, and strengthen and uplift them. So together, uh, let's repeat, uh, and recite Psalm uh, 3. O oh Lord, how are my foes are multiplied. Many are rising against me. Many are saying about my life, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. You are my glory and the one who lifts up my head. With a loud voice, I cry out to the Lord. And he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I awake because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of the thousands of people who line up against me on all sides. Rise up, O Lord. Save me, my God. Yes, you will strike all my enemies on the jaw. The teeth of the wicked you will break. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing rests on your people. When you're scared, no matter what it is, it could be human beings or even more appropriately the devil. Can this psalm help you? Yeah. Nobody can defeat the Lord. Doesn't matter who they are. And notice it does have this note of vindictiveness and vengeance. Strike my enemies. Who's going to do the striking? Is it me? Lord, empower my fist to strike my enemies? No. Who's going to strike the enemy? God. Vengeance to the Lord. Leave vengeance to the Lord. And maybe one of the ways he'll strike our enemies is he'll change them, convert them from enemies into fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Believers. All right, plus our scripture passages. Let's now prepare to uh, watch our episode, episode two of season three. Chrissy, you're going to get the lights for us. Stop recording. 
Norma, I have muted you, and Jill and Gary, I'm going to mute you. Unmute yourself when we're all done so you can talk, okay? Did you quit recording? Oh, nope, I have to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Welcome back, everyone. We just watched uh, season number three, episode number two. And uh, boy, this Bible study is getting longer and longer and longer. I'm sorry, but uh, we'll take just a few moments here and uh, talk about it. What did you think? Okay. What stands out in your mind? Thomas and Ram. Thomas and Rama? Yeah. Cute little story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Once so, again. I was just going to ask if. No, no. We know there's a disciple named Thomas. Might be somebody named Rabbi. I believe there is, but there's no connection there in the Bible. But, you know, they, they present a good example of what marriage was like back then. It was arranged, usually by the fathers. And you notice, uh, was it John asked if uh, Thomas had an older brother? If the if the father wasn't was dead, the older brother would step in. But that's kind of how it went. And we know from... Uh, Jesus, it was uh, you were betrothed first uh, at the right age, and it was a written agreement, and you were considered as married, but the marriage wasn't consumed for a period of nine months to a year. But you were as good as married. And uh, at that time, the husband to be would build a house or build a room in addition onto his father's house, and uh, they weren't supposed to have contact or talk. Um, and nine months would pretty much tell you that when he married her, if there was a child, it's his. So. Anything else? Two major emotional episodes, and what were they? Two major emotional scenes. Man, one at the beginning, one at the end? The beginning? One at the end. Wasn't that special? Yes. Did you like that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Matthew come home, made up his mama and daddy. How did he make up, Mike? What did what did Matthew do? Confessed his sins. Just a little bit? But not his sin, but uh he, yeah, he confessed his sins. And how did he confess? From his heart. Yeah, it was from his heart, wasn't it? It was full. Not not only did he do wrong, but he embarrassed them. He ruined his father's business, he ruined his father's reputation and his mother's reputation. It was, a, it was a pretty heartfelt confession, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. and then how did his father respond? Okay. But, but Mama had something to do with it, too. She did. But do you think it was all just her? Mm -hmm. Did you notice how awkward it was at the beginning before they said anything? Mm -hmm. Who initiated this whole reconciliation? Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. Rolled right into it, didn't he? Talk about he, he was uh, the missionary journey and, and then talked about what his rabbi was saying and then went right into it. And uh, did the father do any confessing? Yes. He did. Yeah. Surprised me that he said that he was there. He was there. Oh. I heard him too, Matthew. And then she noticed even further, they were actually proud of him, weren't they? Mm -hmm. They were no longer accusing him of sh of shaming the family name. Now, he's bringing honor to it. And what did they find out especially? What position, what job does Matthew do? Drive. Drive. Yeah. Made, him, made mom and dad proud, didn't it? Emotional moment number one. What was the second one? Jesus telling them that he's sending them out two by two. Yeah, that was hard. We, you noticed some looks between uh, Simon Peter and his wife. And his wife. What was mm -hmm. that about? They wanted to start a family. Yeah. Does God sometimes interrupt our plans? Yep. What did you notice with, when Thomas came to ask Jesus permission? What did you find out? Did Jesus already know about it? Yes, yes. Because somebody told him? 
No. He's God. And what, you know, once again, this is totally not part of the Bible, but it is very Jesus-like. What did Jesus do for Thomas in the sending out? Sometimes her dad is. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Very cool. One more big emotional moment. Jesus and little James. Yes. Little James, did that catch you? Yes. Very much so. Something maybe you've thought about before. Plenty of things in my life and in your life that Jesus could heal and he doesn't. Why was he not healing little James? He said he could. Can you imagine how hard that is to know that? What was Jesus saying? Why wasn't he going to heal little James? Because he wanted him to tell his story to others and to help them to believe in the Lord. Somebody that has the power to heal and has faith in the healing God, even though that God has not healed him. Kind of along the lines of Paul and his uh, thorn and his flesh, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What were Jesus' final words? That was a choker for me. He was walking away and then he turns back. Remember what he said? Yeah. When yeah. will that happen? Yeah. Hang on for a little bit longer. Not the first time you see Jesus when he's thinking about the future of the disciples. He looks sad a little bit. What's going to happen to uh, 10 out of the 11 disciples? Horribly. John's the only one that lives what we believe to be a natural life. And even then, he, tradition has it, he was boiled in oil. He was, we know he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Yeah. In a little while, what does Jesus know is going to happen? He's going to suffer. He's going to learn what it means to follow Jesus. He said that to them in the group. And following Jesus for them means they'll follow him in suffering and death. As a martyr. As a witness. Martyr is a Greek word for witness. One of the greatest ways we witness to our faith in Christ is being willing to give up our lives. In a spiritual sense, but also in a physical sense, sometimes. Pretty strong moment, wasn't it? Anything else catchy? What the disciple at the end prayed for all them? But the last prayer he did. Yeah, Peter. Peter, yeah. That was Simon Peter. Yeah. He's praying right along with him. Got them all praying. Mm -hmm. Even Matthew was praying. He obviously had learned that psalm, right? And at the end, and it is a prayer. Psalms are a prayer, so it's a great thing to recite. And you know, say all of the lifting it up to God. Yeah. Well, the, yes. to me too, the, the big change was um, how they were all doubting they could do it. How right at the end, that with God's help they could do it, that they were willing to do it. That that big change in their attitude from when the first hearing. Very good catch, Marma. Yeah. Is it Gaius? Gaius. Gaius. Mm -hmm. Gaius was there. Wasn't yeah, it? he's got something going on. Yeah. He's um, thinking he, hard. Yeah. Huh? He's thinking hard. Gaius. Gaius. Yep. But he. How does he feel about Matthew? Like a brother. Brother. Yeah. Very yeah. protective. Wasn't that? Wasn't that sweet? He's yeah. there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's something going on. Yeah, at the very beginning, as Gaius and mm -hmm. uh, Atticus are looking out at the encampment, well, who was there for the Sermon on the Mount? Both of them. Mm -hmm. You remember Atticus said a few things to Gaius, and Gaius just was... He didn't have much to say. Good talk. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know he, what... I don't know what Atticus is, but he's like manipulating everything. Yeah. Even he's a, he's a, Quintus, he was manipulating Quintus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's he's a cohort. A cohort was kind of like the secret police for for uh, Caesar. Bodyguards slash secret police. They would go any place that there was trouble. 
And last thing Rome or Caesar wants is trouble, so they would put a stop to it. So he's kind of like secret police. He is not a direct directly over uh, Quintus, but he kind of is. Yeah, I, I love the meeting with uh, Gaius and, and Atticus and Quintus. Wasn't mm -hmm. that good? They walk in and yeah. did, did you catch what the problem was? Why why Quintus was so upset? Sewer. The sewer they had drinking water. Keep that in mind. That's going to come up in a little bit. I did yeah. see that when the other Simon, the zealot, had pulled water up and he smelled yeah. it and he dumped it. And then he noticed that Atticus was drunk. Atticus, yeah, he, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm not, it, it was, when I watch it this time, and I've seen it before, I was surprised this last time where Atticus, I mean, Quintus is ready just to kick them all out, right? You tell Gaius is afraid that'll happen. Not so much even because of Matthew, but because he's, like you said, there's something working in him, isn't it? The Holy Spirit's working in him. But who's, what does Atticus do in regards to kicking the people out? Is he all for it? Is he encouraging Quintus to do that? No. No, Why? get more money. Yeah. Right, hit them where it counts, right? <laughs> Look, you don't want to get rid of them. Redraw the city lines and then they'll become taxpayers. But also worried about the pilot or about Rome, I mean. You know, yeah, yeah. When, when it comes to reinforcing the law, he's the one that mentions watch out for your future. So, kind of, you get the idea this is the Lord working through an unbeliever to protect those people. Quintus's uh, motives are a little bit difficult. Who, why, why did he chase after Simon the Zealot? What was what was the purpose of that encounter? To tell him the order was there and they would be after him. Which is kind of a nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. What does he reveal to Simon that he knows, that Atticus knows? That he was going to kill him. Yeah. yeah. Simon says, why did you let me into Jerusalem? Did you think you could stop me? My chances were pretty good. But now Atticus knows that, uh, you know, he says, you're, no, you're not a zealot anymore. Simon says, how do you know I won't put a knife in you? Because I saw your master throw it in the river. <laughs> now you're defenseless. Interesting plot lines going on there, isn't it? And uh, up through the end of season three, they don't all play out. I'm assuming we'll get them in. Interesting stuff there. Anything else? I had something else, but it flew out the window. <laughs> I'm wondering my, what that what that special oil is going to mean later on, too. That um, Matthew's oh. father has developed. <laughs> That, that, wasn't that the olive oil, but it was things oh, that, yeah. That's, that's James, John, that's and, John and James' father. Yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll come up again. Yeah. Anything else? There's probably a bunch more, and uh, y'all can talk about it on your own. And uh, But it was good. Good episode. Very good. Mm -hmm. Let's do it again a week from today, shall we? Sounds like a plan. Yes. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the men and women that have put this show together, for the accuracy that it shows us what life was like back when Jesus walked the earth. But Lord, even more than this movie, we thank you for your gospels through scripture, which teaches us and proclaims to us your truth better than anything else can. Help us to hang fast to that truth and know Jesus as he's been presented in this episode, but also in scripture as being the loving, caring Savior that he is, who cares about each one of us. And you've created each of us special to be a part of the ministry of proclaiming the gospel. Enliven us to do that. Walk with us now as we leave and bring us back together again this weekend to worship and praise you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye. Bye. See you Sunday.